Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Emilio and we are looking at servers today. Uh, we're specifically going to be looking at the top 20 types of servers. So we're talking about physical servers and virtual servers and essentially the function of a server and the top 20 that you'll commonly see in uh, most businesses around the world. Um, some companies will have a lot of these, some companies may only have a couple of these. It's really gonna vary on the type of business, but we're gonna be looking at these top 20, hopefully give you some ideas, perhaps you have built some of these yourselves, perhaps you're thinking about building some of these. Before we do get into this, please remember, as always, to subscribe to my channel. Really, really do appreciate it, and click on that bell so that you don't miss any of my video releases. If you are perhaps new to servers, you want to understand a little bit more about servers, specifically around perhaps Windows Server 2019, uh, which is the current version of the Microsoft Server Operating System, I do have a uh, full training course, about five hours worth of training course uh, available. Uh, you can check that out in my description. And essentially we're covering all things servers. We are talking about how to build domain controllers, how to work with Active Directory, definitions and setups of DNS, DHCP, group policies, the whole lot. So that course would be very, very helpful for you. So let's now go through this top 20. Uh, we'll go through them really quickly, give you a bit of an overview around each of these and what they are. Number one is a file server, a very, very common server. A lot of companies will have these um, and it's essentially a server that is for storing files and folders. Um, so you're gonna be you know, saving business data um, documents, uh, images, whatever the actual company does, it's gonna be stored on a file server or a fleet of file servers. And then this file server is gonna be accessible on the network for people to connect to it. So commonly, if you are working in a company and if you're running on a Windows computer, you open up your My Computer, your File Explorer, and you've got other drives. You have, your, of course, your C drive, which is your primary Windows installation. But then you may have a G drive, an H drive, an F drive, a Z drive, all of these other drives, most of the time they're gonna be pointing perhaps to a file server of some sort uh, where that particular, you know, if you're in marketing, if you're in sales, if you're in finance, that could be data that is relevant to that department and it is stored on a file server. Commonly a file server would use protocols such as SMB, uh, NFS as well is common. Uh, it could be on a Windows-based file server environment could be on a Linux-based file server environment. You could even have a NAS, which is a network attached storage, which is acting as a file server as well. Second one is what's called a domain controller. This is almost like the elementary server to ensure that your network and all of your servers and all of your devices, laptops, desktops, Mac, PC, Linux, are all communicating within this environment um, called Active Directory, and Active Directory is stored on a domain controller. So you'd build a Windows server, you then go and install a domain controller role, you then go and have all of your Active Directory tools where you manage all of your users, your permissions, what people can and can't access, the computers that are bound to this thing called a domain is all managed within a domain controller. Within the domain controller, you also have things such as group policies that essentially allow you to push out policies to a fleet of computers on your network, not just desktops and laptops, but also servers, making sure that the passwords, for example, are complex. Uh, perhaps you want every computer on the network to have the same wallpaper, the same screensaver. Perhaps you want to disable right click, you want to disable access to control control panel, all of this is all controlled via group policies on a domain controller. You've then got a DNS server. Now commonly a DNS server will also sit on a domain controller as well, but if you are in a larger business, you may have multiple DNS servers. And of course, DNS is going to convert your host name, your fully qualified domain name, which is a FQDN, uh, to a IP address. So the whole DNS server controls um, you know, when you ping a particular server, when you ping a website, when you ping whatever it is within your organization via a normal host name or FQDN, it then will resolve to an IP address. You can also do reverse lookups on an IP address to go and resolve against a host name. But this is almost like the address book for all of your IPs and for all of your systems on your network to sort of resolve between each other. Number four is your DHCP server. Now, 
a computer on the network, how does it get an IP address? Well, commonly, it's gonna be plugged into a network, it's gonna be connected to a Wi-Fi device, it's gonna go and scan your network and ask for an IP address from something called a DHCP server. The DHCP server manages all of your IPs for all of your devices and then pushes out an, a relevant IP address to a computer, to a server, to a Internet of Things, an IoT device, whatever it may be. Um, and it gives it perhaps not just an IP, but also the router, uh, the gateway address, the DNS addresses and other information as well. A web server, of course, you've got to run a website someplace uh, and that is stored on a web server. You could have something like Microsoft's IIS, uh, which is common with the Windows Server fleet. Uh, alternatively, you can use something like Apache, you can use PHP and you can store that on there. You could even run things such as WordPress or Drupal or other sorts of web applications on a web server. Web servers and other servers will communicate with something like a database server perhaps. A database server uh, could be running something like Microsoft's SQL. Uh, it could be running um, Oracle, for example. It could be running MySQL as well, uh, which is a free version. And it's essentially just a database. Essentially think about it as a big repository of information and a website, an application, something on your network goes and queries your database to retrieve information. The database is uh, almost elementary for a lot of applications and websites nowadays, especially when you're looking at hundreds and thousands and thousands, perhaps millions of rows and cells uh, that need to be contained in a centralized location, such as a database. An email server, most commonly being something like an exchange server. Uh, nowadays, these may be a little bit less common because a lot of companies nowadays are going on the cloud and they're using the Microsoft 365 services, essentially exchange on the cloud. But a lot of places still do have some form of a internal email server, whether that be Exchange, whether that be some sort of an SMTP service or a relay or something like that, but something that is hosting email services or at least managing some sort of email mail services within a company. Application servers are a very broad term, but an application server can store one or multiple different types of applications. These could be apps that are specific to your organization. They, they may have been developed in-house. They're used just by a particular company and they're not used anywhere else. And that application is stored on a server and that server becomes an application server. There are other apps that you may have, other third-party applications that are installed on an app and that could be an application server as well. There could be an application server storing multiple apps and it's just a common name application server and that could be housing multiple apps, providing multiple different types of services out to the network and out to your users and computers and servers perhaps as well. Now it's very important to make sure that all of your data is kept safe, that all of your data is backed up. Uh, it's elementary and almost every single organization needs some sort of a backup mechanism, backup process in place to make sure that all of your data is backed up. Now, whether that be backing up your end user computers, your desktops and laptops, but at least you need to make sure that your servers are being backed up. That data is being backed up to tape, to a hard drive, to the cloud, sent off site, to another replication server in another location, whatever that is, it needs to be managed by some sort of a backup server. Now, the most common sorts of um, applications or backup processes or apps that you could use would be the big ones being Veeam, you've got Commvault, you've got NetBackup, you've got IBM's TSM as well, and there are some others out there as well. So backup server using these apps, configuring your backups. So if you do lose data, you have that confidence that your backups are there and that you can restore the data. Every computer on your network, every server on your network have updates that need to be installed from time to time. Uh, of course, if you are familiar with IT uh, a little bit and you've worked in IT in a company, you will know that Microsoft release patches every second Tuesday of the month. They call it Patch Tuesday. Other companies, Apple, uh, Linux as well, different versions there, and even applications are releasing updates from time to time. Apps need to be updated. The operating system needs to be updated. These vendors don't just release patches for the sake of releasing patches. Often, they have identified some sort of a security vulnerability. There is something, there's a bug, there's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, there are perhaps updates, feature updates that need to be deployed 
And all of this can be managed in a patching server, a server that is dedicated for patching. Common ones would be something like WSUS, which is used for patching out Windows computers and servers, SCCM. You've also got other ones such as Jamf for the Mac, uh, and you've even got SolarWinds Patch Manager and others out there which are third-party patch management solutions for patching your fleet of computers and servers. Management of phones need to be done somehow. So these are desk phones, perhaps even mobile phones, but we'll focus on desk phones, specifically VoIP, uh, voice over IP, these phones need to be managed centrally somewhere. They're gonna be connecting or at least communicating with sort of like some sort of a VoIP system, a PBX, something out to the outside world. You're gonna be doing SIP trunks. They're gonna be connecting to perhaps um, phone switching uh, devices that you've got in your comms cabinet, in your server cabinet as well, but it all needs to be centrally managed within some system that can you know, manage extensions, manage groups, all done through a phone server. If you do a lot of printing, even if you do a little bit of printing, you can have a print server also set up. Commonly, um, if you're in a smaller organization or even in a medium organization, the print server services could actually be run on any server. Um, some, some places actually have it running on their domain controller or their file server. They just install the printers onto there. But if you've got a lot of printers, perhaps you have multiple floors, you've got multiple buildings, multiple sites, um, it's sometimes a good idea to actually have a dedicated print server that is managing all of your printers, all of your printer queues, and all the relevant drivers for all of your printers for both Mac and PC. Other things that print servers are very common for as well is now something like follow me printing or printing where you send a print, uh, it, gets, it gets added to a queue within there. And then there's some specific print server software that is now tied to ID cards, to fobs, to sort of some sort of swiping device where a user now goes to a printer, swipes their pass onto the printer and then the print will come out. It's more like a secure printing and all of that is managed through print servers. FTP and SFTP servers. Uh, if you have an external company who you need to send files to and from, you could house this within one of these FTP or SFTP servers. Of course, the differences between FTP and SFTP is SFTP is more secure and is encry encrypted and things like that. So generally, I would recommend SFTP but they're very common to use still nowadays where you need to send a file to an external person, you store it into this SFTP, perhaps this server is external facing, it has proper security, it's in what's called a DMZ or a DMZ zone, and then you give credentials, you set up an account for an external company that can then log in and they have access to that file that you've just shared with them. And that's really the whole purpose of that server. So to ensure the health of all of your servers, you could set up some sort of a monitoring server. Uh, this is a server where you actually install some software, you then scan your network, you add devices, you add servers into this monitoring software, and it essentially monitors the health of your equipment. Uh, the CPU, the RAM, the hard drive space, uh, how is your how are your switches performing, how is your firewall performing, intrusion detection sort of stuff. And there's a lot of apps that can do this really, really well. You've got things such as Orion, you've got PRTG, you've got Nagios, there's all of these other apps out there as well that can essentially control and monitor your, uh, your servers, for example. And then when things are triggered, when things are going wrong, when the CPU is too high, it sends alerts to the right people so that you know when things go wrong and you can prevent things from going worse because you are alerted to uh, something that may have happened on your network accordingly and then you can respond to it. If you're in a building that has some sort of building security, you have your doors that need passes, perhaps you have CCTV cameras, you have other sorts of security in your organization, a server or fleet of servers needs to manage this. Essentially, your building security, um, again, that passes, CCTV, and other things like that. How about the security of your network? Uh, now, you can have firewalls that are software-based firewalls. You could have proxies that are software-based proxies. You can also have hardware firewalls, where actually you go and buy yourself an actual hardware-based firewall, hardware-based proxies, or you can have software versions of those which are running on a server. So an example of this would be something like PFSense, which is a software-based firewall. You can also use it as a proxy or configure it with some sort of proxy services. And 
that is that is sitting on a server. It's a Linux-based server, um, but it is acting as a firewall. And then you point your devices to go and filter the traffic in and out through your network through a software-based firewall, which is sitting on a server. Similar to that, you've also got load balancing servers. Uh, again, load balancers can also be in a hardware form where you purchase load balancing servers, or you can go software-based load balancing servers. A very good example of this is a website that get, that gets a lot of traffic. The last thing that you wanna happen is you get tens of thousands, millions of hits on a website, and then that one website crashes because it cannot handle the traffic, or you need traffic to be filtered between different locations. So what it does instead is it hits some sort of a load balancing server that then can spread the load across multiple locations based on a number of different requirements or prerequisites that you configure in that load balancing server. The next one is a terminal server or a remote desktop server. This is essentially like a jump box. Uh, so this is a place where people log in to the server to then access something, access perhaps another server. So for example, you may not want your staff to have direct access to a particular server. You may not want your IT staff to not have access to a particular server, but they can access services on another server through almost like a jump box or entry gate server uh, called a terminal server. And that could be for a specific purpose. So for example, you may not want your staff to access your domain controller directly. You know, you don't want Active Directory tools available to your IT staff by them logging into a domain controller. So you could set up a terminal server with the Active Directory tools installed onto there and then, of course, that in turn talks to your domain controller. So your staff access the terminal server to access the services from another server or some other application that could even be configured within a terminal server. Then we're talking about virtualization. Now, we didn't talk about this too much, but of course, you can have physical servers. You can have virtual servers. Physical servers in the olden days, you would actually go and install physical servers lots of them and install one particular service on a physical server. You would install a file server on one physical server, a mail server on another physical server, a DNS server on another physical server. Nowadays, a lot of this is all virtualized. So you get a physical server, you install some software onto that, you convert it into what's called a hypervisor, and then you can build multiple virtual machines within that hypervisor. I would recommend going and checking out some of my videos when it, about this if you do want to learn more. Do check out that video right there where we are talking about physical versus virtual servers so you can get a good understanding around that. But essentially, some physical servers will keep, could be converted into hypervisors, the most common ones being VMware's ESXi, You've got Citrix, Zen Server, you even got Microsoft's Hyper-V. And essentially this is a host now, a virtual host or a physical host acting as a virtual hypervisor to allow you to install virtual machines so that you can then go and build your network. And then you've got a server to essentially manage your fleet of servers. An example of this is VMware's vCenter. Uh, this is a piece of application software that you install and set up on a server. And then you can go and manage your fleet of ESXi hosts, your VMware's ESXi hosts. So your, your fleet of um, hypervisors are managed by one central server, in this case called a vCenter server. And the other vendors such as Microsoft and Citrix have similar things because the last thing that you wanna do is be logging into each individual hypervisor Okay, we talked about that one before, one by one. So you have one central or a pool of central vCenter servers or virtualization server host servers to go and manage all the fleet in one centralized location. So that was the 20. A uh, lot of stuff to talk through. We did a very, very brief snapshot on each of these, but hopefully you learned something new. Please do comment perhaps down below uh, if you've used some of these, if you've built yourself some of these. But other than that, look, I hope you found this helpful. There was a lot of stuff there. Um, and thank you really again for spending the time and uh, watching my channel. Uh, do check out some of my other videos as well and uh, subscribe as always, clicking on that uh, face right there. And do look at some of my other videos if you do want to learn more about servers and about anything else that's happening in tech. Thank you so much for watching, really appreciate it. We'll see you next time.